Hello and welcome to Philosophy Vibe, the channel where we discuss and debate different philosophical ideas. Today we're going to be focusing on some political philosophy and looking into probably one of the most influential works on modern politics, and that is John Rawls and his theory of a just and fair society. Fascinating. So, John Rawls was a 20th century political philosopher. His most popular work was the 1971 book A Theory of Justice. Here, he lays out what a just society would look like. No matter where you are in the world, I am sure you look at elements of your society and think that there are injustices, that things are not completely fair, that not all people are treated the same and seen as equal, and some people exercise power and control over others. This has been the case throughout all of human history, and whilst things were undeniably worse in the past, I do not think anyone can say they live in a completely fair and just society. Rawls, however, proposed his political philosophy as the solution, offering a remarkable theory as to how we can reach a truly just and fair society. That is very ambitious. So, how does Rawls propose for us to reach this just and fair society? Rawls proposed what he referred to as the original position. This is the idea that all people come together to form a social contract and reach an agreement as to what principles would be the fairest and just to be applied to all. Rawls wanted all people to come together in a completely impartial and unbiased way to find principles that everyone agrees to, to find the principles of justice and fairness for our society. The original position would ensure unanimous consensus on the basic and core structure of our society, not the tiny details, but the fundamental principles that apply to every living person. Yes, I understand, but this sounds like a utopian fantasy. People cannot come to this original position in a completely impartial and unbiased way. Firstly, humans are self-interested. We have people with wealth and power who would want to hold on to this, and we will have poorer people who will try to gain. Each person will want what is best for themselves, so they cannot be impartial or unbiased. Secondly, humans belong in different groups, an endless amount, whether it is family or racial groups or ethnicity or sex or gender, sexuality, religion, even hobby preferences or sports team affiliations. As selfish people, we will always want what is best for our groups, and again, this will diminish any sort of impartiality. Yes, you are correct. People are selfish. They will be out to gain the most for themselves and their groups. However, Rawls conducted a little thought experiment. When we are at this original position, Rawls asked us to imagine a hypothetical veil of ignorance that covers all people. What's a veil of ignorance? So, Rawls claims when we reach this original position to start negotiating on a just and fair society, the veil of ignorance will cover us, and when it does, we will instantly forget all details about ourselves. We will be ignorant as to what race we are, what ethnic background we have, what religion we are, what sex or gender we are, even our desires, our conceptions of good, and our psychological propensities. We will still be conscious, and we will still be rational, but all the details that makes us an individual will be forgotten. I see. So. Here we are at the table with every other human on the planet ready to negotiate the just and fair society. Only we do not know anything about ourselves. We have no idea what life we will live once the negotiations are over. We do not know if we will be male or female, black or white, rich or poor, we have no idea. And once these negotiations are complete and we rediscover who we are, there is no going back. What is agreed is agreed forever. So. How would we approach these negotiations? Would we rationally afford more rights to some and less to others if we do not know which side we will fall on? Would we, for example, offer less rights to women if we do not know if we are male or female? Would we give more power to certain races if we have no idea which race we are? We wouldn't. 
It would be completely irrational to do so. So it is here we can start a social contract with everyone from a purely impartial way. If we have no clue where we are on the social spectrum, where our place is in society, we would want to make sure that wherever we land and whoever we are, we will have the same rights, privileges and freedoms as anyone else. It would be irrational to demand that certain people have less rights and freedoms if we could very well be part of that social group. Yes, this makes sense. If we come to this original position wearing the veil of ignorance, we would never rationally privilege or detriment any person or persons in our society as it could be us. Yes, I see. However, Rules still maintains that we can approach the negotiations in a selfish manner. We can still negotiate from a selfish position, and a selfish position would mean we would not want to live a life with less rights. We would not want to live a life with less freedoms. We would want the most liberty and well-being possible. In order to achieve this, it would mean that all people would be afforded the most liberty and well-being possible, as we could be any one of those people. So, the original position allows us to negotiate in a selfish way, but the veil of ignorance ensures an unbiased approach and guarantees fairness to all people, no matter their status or background. Very fascinating. As Rawls continues with the thought experiment, he then reaches the essential part of his political philosophy. What the rational, selfish people behind the veil of ignorance would then accept as the basis of society becomes Rawls's principles of justice. These are the principles everyone at the original position would accept as universal and would want to protect. Rawls divided these into two principles. The first is the Equal Liberty Principle. Here, Rawls argues that all people would want equal basic liberties and rights identified as political liberty, such as the right to vote and hold public office, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, liberty of conscience, freedom of thought, freedom of the person, right to hold private property, and freedom from arbitrary arrest and seizure. Any rational person would want all people to have these rights, especially if they do not know what type of person they are. These would be universal rights and freedoms no matter who you are. Yes. The second principle of justice is actually split into two. Number one is equality of opportunity. No matter who we are, how rich or poor, what our background is, we all have the same opportunity to succeed. Meaning, if anyone has certain talents or abilities, they have the same amount of opportunity to succeed as anyone else. We can all reach any position based on merit alone, and we all have the same opportunity to acquire and build our skills and knowledge and talents. Again, if you do not know where you sit in society, equal opportunity would be the most rational principle to agree to. Yes, I understand. And number two of the second principle is concerned with the distribution of wealth. This is known as the difference principle. If you are at the original position behind the veil of ignorance, you have no idea how rich or poor you are. So, how would you negotiate? It could very well be that you leave the original position and discover that you are part of the poorest section of society. So, the rational thing to want is for the poorest section to still have a pretty great quality of life. And so, the difference principle claims that society should be arranged as to the greatest benefit to the least advantaged. What does that mean? What Rawls is saying is that when society is structured, we should always look at whether this would benefit the least advantaged. It could be argued that the super rich class of very few individuals make major societal choices based on what will benefit their businesses and their wealth. However, if no one knew if they were rich or poor, the choices would be to look at what's in the interest for the poorest people. So, wouldn't complete equality be the best thing? There is no rich or poor, everyone is exactly the same. Not necessarily. Notice that Rawls' difference principle is to focus on the benefit to the least advantaged, meaning that if there is inequality, then this inequality can actually be good if it means that as a result of the inequality, the poorest section actually have a better quality of life. 
Think of it like this. Imagine there is a genius inventor and entrepreneur in a society that allows no inequality and mandates exactly how much you can earn. This inventor may feel no desire or interest to create this amazing new technology. If, however, we allow inequality, this inventor goes on to create this new technology and this new technology gives the poorest people a better quality of life. It creates jobs that people need, it creates tax from the revenue that goes on to help the poor. Even though the inventor is now a billionaire and there is now a huge inequality between the inventor and the poorest in society, the poor are in fact better off because of this inequality. The poor are better off than they were before. Yes, I see. So, if we look at these four charts of the upper, middle and lower class and look at the average yearly earnings. Chart 1, upper class receives $1 million, the middle class $100,000 and the lower class $10,000. Chart 2, the upper class receives $300,000, the middle class receives $200,000 and the lower class receives $5,000. Charts 3, the upper class receives $15,000, the middle class receives $15,000, and the lower class receives $15,000. And chart 4, the upper class receives $400,000, the middle class receives $80,000, and the lower class receives $30,000. So, out of all of these, chart 4 is the desired outcome as the least advantaged are the best off. Even though the inequality is greater than say chart 2, and even though there's complete equality in chart 3, chart 4 gives the least advantage the most money and wealth. Right. So there we have Rawls' philosophy on justice and fairness. Our societies need to be ordered from the original position, where all people begin their negotiations behind a veil of ignorance. This complete impartiality will result in the principles of justice, where all people will be guaranteed equal liberty and rights, equal opportunities, and society will be ordered so as to benefit the least advantaged. A brilliant political philosophy. It is clear how much this philosophy has shaped our modern day politics and political policies. The idea of equality and helping the least advantaged is very much a major focus for all political parties. The original position and the veil of ignorance is a wonderful thought experiment to eliminate bias in any political decision. Indeed. However, I feel that there are potential objections to Rawls's theory of justice. Like what? I fully understand Rawls's rationale as to how people would negotiate the core principles of their society behind the veil of ignorance. However, could it be argued that some gambling in terms of the structure and rights can very well be considered rational? What do you mean? Could it be argued that the original position that say 2% of the population can have all their rights stripped and used as a servant class for the rest of the population and their property and wealth being distributed to the other 98%. There is only a 2% chance we will fall into this category and at the same time we could have a servant class working for us. This might be seen as a reasonable gamble. No, I disagree. I think this would be an irrational move. There is still a chance you may end up in this servant class with no rights or property and the only gain would be that you may occasionally have access to a servant. It is not a worthwhile or rational gamble. Says you, but others may disagree. I would be interested to hear from someone who genuinely believes this to be a rational move, but I don't see it as such. Okay, consider someone who hates population X. This person has very prejudiced views on this population, and in fact, they would say, I want population X to be oppressed, and if I was part of population X, I would want to be oppressed. Now, could they not then infect their prejudice at the original position, even behind the veil of ignorance? Again, the original position is meant for rational discourse and thought. This is very much an irrational way to think. Furthermore, Rawls specifically says that behind the veil of ignorance, we lose our desires, our conceptions of good and our psychological propensities. So their hatred for population X or their affinity for population Y would not exist at the original position behind the veil of ignorance. So this would not factor into the negotiation. 
Okay, well, as you have brought this up, if we wear this veil of ignorance and we lose our desires, our conceptions of good and our psychological propensities, then how can we actually reach Rawls' principles of justice? Surely our ideas around equality and liberty would be part of our conceptions of good. If we lose this, then how can we still value equality and liberty? How can we value anything? If we are behind this veil, then nothing would seem good or bad, right or wrong just or unjust, so how could we possibly structure society? That is a very good point. Rawls did in fact argue that even though we lose our conception of good, we still hold on to what he refers to as primary goods, which would be our desire to value things such as basic rights and liberties, freedom of movement and choice, powers of the office, income and wealth and self-respect. The persistence of primary goods behind the veil will allow us to reach the principles of justice. Okay, but I think these primary goods can be challenged on a meta-ethical level. Do all people value income and wealth, freedom of movement, etc, etc? There is a case that Rawls' theory of justice is working off a bit of an assumption here. Hmm. And finally, I think the difference principle can really be challenged. The idea that structuring society around the least advantaged is not necessarily the best approach. If we go back to the four charts, Rules would choose chart 4, but I would argue chart 2 is the more desirable and even the moral choice for the simple fact that the middle class, which tends to be the biggest class in terms of numbers, are clearly the best off. This results in more wealth and well-being overall. So here you are choosing the utilitarian principle and seeing the just and fair choice as that which results in the greatest good for the greatest number. Yes, I guess I am. Setting aside the major problems with utilitarianism as a theory, it still means that behind the veil, you do not know what class you are in society. You would be opting for chart 2, with the possibility that you could very well be in the lower class and therefore you will be worse off. Correct, but I am also basing this on the fact that the middle class is the largest class in terms of population, so the odds would put me in this category, I am therefore gambling for a higher payout for the likeliest outcome, a gamble that I would consider rational. I would have to disagree. Very well. If you would like the script to this video and you would like to help support the channel, then please check out our Philosophy Vibe Political Philosophy ebook available on Amazon. It has all the scripts to our Political Philosophy videos. It is also included in the Philosophy Vibe Paperback Anthology, Volume 3, Ethics and Political Philosophy. A really great read, perfect for anyone studying ethics and political philosophy or anyone looking to get into the subject. This too is available on Amazon. Links are below. But that's all the time we have for now. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed the vibe. And what does everyone else think? Who favours rules' theory of justice and fairness? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to like and share. And for more philosophical debates, please subscribe to the channel. Take care and we'll see you in the next video.